Thanks to Sarah Dalton. And the conversation will begin right now as Nigeria's electoral umpire has warned of elections being cancelled or postponed if insecurity persists in the country. This is coming barely 45 days before the general elections scheduled for February 25, March February and March 23 to elect a new president, members of the Senate and House of Representatives. Recall that in 2019, the elections originally slated for the 16th of February had to be postponed to the 25th of February due to logistical challenges in acquiring electoral materials. Now, for many years, the Nigerian government has, faced, has been faced with the challenge of containing terrorism, banditry and other forms of insecurity ravaging several parts of the country. Just recently, an unspecified number of travellers waiting to board a train from Igweben in Edo State to Delta State were kidnapped between 2019 and 2022. The Independent National Electoral Commission says it had recorded around 50 attacks in its offices. However, the federal government has said nothing will stop the 2023 election from taking place. Now, join us to discuss this and make sense of all of this is a conflict and security expert, Salahuddin Hashim, who joins us from the nation's capital, Abuja. A warm welcome to you, uh, Salahuddin. Now, in December, the Independent National Electoral Commission ruled out any possibility of postponing the 2023 general elections due to uh, insecurity. What is the current state of security uh, in the country, and do you think it's safe enough to conduct elections uh, going by recent attacks on INEC offices? Uh, thank you very much for having me. I think it is very important to paint the picture, uh, and obviously when we do that, it offers us an opportunity uh, to draw that conclusion. Uh, it was in May 2022 uh, that the INEC chairman actually raised that alarm and said, look, he's very concerned uh, that uh, security might be uh, a very critical uh, factor to consider uh, in the build up into the elections. And I had thought that security agencies would, as a matter of fact, translate that concern into an actionable plan that helped them to begin to engage more constructively. Uh, but in trying to paint the picture to you, I would tell you that uh, in the last uh, uh, two years, there has been a lot of worry and concern about how certain states, about 14 states, are currently on that critical watch list uh, where activities of bandits and security uh, instability, some in the northeast, some in the northwest, um, now most importantly in the southeast, are now threatening uh, that uh, they are going to uh, disrupt uh, the elections. And obviously they are doing this uh, not without any uh, verbal threat, but of course providing some sophisticated approach and coordinating uh, those attacks. And obviously your report, uh, we have just heard uh, how many INEC facilities uh, that have been attacked. And of course, to let you know uh, that just in one year, there have been about 20 different police stations that have been raised down as a result of uh, all of these uh, activities. Over 127 police officers have been killed, just police officers. And of course, over 48 uh, 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 military men. And of course, NACDC fire service and all of that also are counting in numbers. Uh, but my point is that we have not seen any deliberate effort uh, by state actors. Uh, one is the fact that there has been over one billion that has been paid in ransom, with over 1,190 1, uh, people kidnapped in the last. Uh, few years, and of course, uh, coming with prophetic declaration to say uh, that election will happen does not work. You must be deliberate, and you must put infrastructure in place that allows this to happen. And one of the ways of dealing with this is to first of all ensure that about 40 communities that are currently within the control of bandits and other non-state actors need to be first of all recovered. You cannot deploy election materials, you cannot de deploy infrastructure, you cannot deploy uh, in fact, to those particular locations because it is considered unsafe. What happens if those locations, for instance, are destroyed?
stronghold of some other political parties. These are some of the concerns that comes readily into mind. And I'll give you one very quick example. Between January and July 2022, over 7,222 persons have been killed, with about 3,823 persons abducted across the country. How do you intend to host an election in an environment like this? And obviously, to be very honest, rising insecurity is now looking like a new normal. Maybe that is the reason why security agencies who have the response right are not doing so, but we need to grapple with it. The different wave is now becoming that there is some level of disjointed approaches uh, to stem this thing from security institution. The apparatus of the state have not come out to guarantee the safety of security, of personnel, of infrastructure, and the apprehension is now building. Okay, we must so look at I like to come in here because you mentioned the fact that they have not come out to secure the people. I, I mean, the federal government, even from our report, has continued to say that they are trying to nip insecurity in the board. And over time, if you would agree with me, for elections, we see a large deployment of security personnel. I mean, you see large numbers. Even for the last elections in the Akiti and Oshun State, we saw a large deployment of security operators there. So what exactly is the issue? Is it the absence of security or the security agencies are just there at the post. Uh, what exactly are the issues? Are they overwhelmed? You don't, you don't have a luxury of number when it comes to a general election. In, in a staggered election, it is very easy for you to be able to do those deployments. Uh, deploying 30,000 to AKT, deploying 20,000, 25,000 to Oshu. You can't, you don't have that luxury when it comes to a general election. And that, for me, is one thing that we need to really deal with. The entire manpower in the police is less than 400,000. And of course, we have about 200 million people. And of course, this is the biggest uh, INEC register that we have in the history of our democratic process. 89 million and counting, and that is actually what we have on that register. How do you expect 400,000 uh, to actually police 89 million people? The that means that you need to be able to coordinate with NSBC, with other security infrastructure <coughs> to be able to do. So manpower and personnel is actually one of the key gaps and a key challenge. That is an obvious fact. The second one is that there are nuances in this election that we need to take very seriously. One is the fact that, as a matter of fact, deployment and physical deployments may not even count much, if you ask me. Why? Because there is a technology uh, component in this election that says that, look, you can transmit results uh, from the police unit. And I tell you, most election challenges happen in transit between the police unit and the collision center. So which means that if we are going to actually transmit electronically, then there is a new wave of security that must be coming, which is the cyber security. A number of people are going to make attempts to want to attack uh, cyber security in this entire gamut. But of course, we are now focusing more on physical security in our conversation today. So, but of course, we need to just uh, put that uh, on the table. There are three components uh, to dealing with uh, threats, uh, assessment in an election security, uh, which is personnel, property, and of course, process. And in all of these three P's, I have not seen the federal government come out to deliberately put infrastructure in place or an architecture to respond. It is very easy. Uh, to honestly uh, say that uh, election will happen irrespective of anything. But I tell you, on the eve of the election, if there is an apathy and people feel unsafe, half of the people on that register will not come out to vote. And that in itself would affect the outcome of the elections. And in itself, I tell you that this has been, there's been a lot of early warning, uh, but unfortunately nobody is actually uh, dealing with that. Some of those early warnings suggested that there has been a need for government at different level to have engaged with non-state armed group uh, to see how to use formal and informal approach. Kinetic approach alone does not solve the problem. You need to also offer soft approach. I agree that sometimes you need those deployments, but soft approach needs to happen. But lastly on this point is to say that security is about perception. If people don't perceive themselves to be safe on election day, a number of people will not come out. Mm. And it will mean that we would have spent so much money to deploy, we would have spent so much money, and of course, we would not say we want to reschedule. It is important that we not take it as a priority in dealing with those early warning issues. So, Laudin, thanks uh, for that uh, overview there. And uh, it's very important uh, that we get uh, security right, because like you said, it could lead uh, to voter apathy and uh, less 
electorate uh, will come out to uh, exercise their franchise. Now, let's talk about the government's response uh, beyond uh, statements saying, you know, elections will hold regardless of what happens. From your expert point of view, uh, elections in 2019 were postponed because of insecurity to buy time. Is there still time to nip this in the bud? It was part of the campaign promise of this administration. Uh, they're coming to the tail end of the administration. It will be eight years to deal with insecurity. And we still have issues of insecurity. And now we're talking about elections that will happen next month. Is there still time to at least make these elections pass with minimal uh, incident? And uh, yes, what, what's the government doing about uh, this pattern of violence, especially on INEC facilities? All right. Um, first of all, uh, to respond to that is to say that, um, yes, uh, the time is still and the window is still open. Uh, but of course, there must be uh, a lot of horizontal and uh, vertical uh, strategies uh, that must be deployed. Uh, there are three phases in an election. One is the pre-election phase. Second is the election phase in itself, and of course, post-election. And of course, you know too well that in this country, we have witnessed uh, various kinds of breakdown in all these three tiers of uh, phases. One is the fact that there are groups and there are different locations where groups have made uh, declarations that the election will not happen. Mm. And Saru in Kaduna, for instance, have said that in Briniguari Axis, that they have banned any election or electoral related activities in that zone. IPOP in the Southeast have done so. They have started disrupting issues and where uh, uh, voters' cards are being collected. They are beginning to attack citizens. They are beginning to attack security agencies. They are, so all of this situation, what if, for instance, on the date of the election, INEC declares sit at home on that day? What exactly would a security agency or government do? There is no amount of... Oh, you mean, I, I, you mean IPOP? Yes. Okay. If IPOP on the day of election declares sit, sit at home, what exactly do you expect? The entire Southeast will become a good post here because nobody will come out and vote. So you realize that there's a need to have a soft approach and a peace building architecture that responds to this and use some kind of backdoor diplomacy to begin to engage groups. I agree a lot of the time that you don't need to negotiate with terrorists. Look, even in developed clients, people register, people negotiate in different terms. But if you decide to grandstand and these people declare a seat at home on that day, how do you manage it? It means that you have lost an entire resources for the whole region. And this is something that we really need to guide against. So it is very important that as a state, we must find some kind of a diplomatic approach to redealing and resolving this issue so that the government will not lose out in its entirety. At the end of the day, it is the people that wins and not any other person. So for the people to win, for government to win, for the states to benefit, we must ensure that we put in all the value chain that provides the kind of result that we want to see. But I tell you, the windows are still open, the opportunities are still there. Okay, so now, now it seems from all you're saying that the government has a whole lot to do of which, of which you know that uh, responsibility falls on the government to secure the people. But from your own observation, I mean, INEC is coming out 45 days. You mentioned in May, even though in December they said that uh, no matter what, the elections will not be postponed or cancelled. What areas do you think have been left unchecked by the Electoral Commission and in such a way that the INEC is not just isolating or alienating itself from issues of the election, aside security? What areas have the Electoral Commission not been able to check uh, check to make sure that these elections are not postponed? Uh, well, uh, as it is now, INEC supposedly seem to be ready uh, from their own end. And I tell you, INEC is one of the most progressive and one most reformed agency of government since we have returned to democracy. Uh, they have been very deliberate in a number of things. But of course, how do you now explain over 40 INEC offices being attacked in 14 states? Uh, and this in itself is something uh, that has happened between February 2019 and of course uh, uh, today. So we need to begin to find ways for the uh, there, there is this, uh, there is this uh, uh, committee on security and election security that must be strengthened. And I've always mentioned that committee is only at the national level. It is only visible at national level. Election is local. 
Security is local. People who would vote are local. There must be a localized solution to all of these issues. You cannot be providing a bureaucratic uh, policy and strategy at the federal level. There is this election intelligence security system they have, they call it ISIS. ISIS is only visible at the federal level. ISIS should be more responsive at state and local level where coordination must happen more strongly and more responsibly. And that, for me, is the primary point and the takeoff point. That particular committee is actually headed by the DIG operations uh, from the police headquarters with all security agencies, all paramilitary agencies, all the agencies of government that relates to the election, how then are we not having those things at some national level? That is where the action happened. That is where the problem lies. That is where the solution lies. You must have those at the tactical level dealing with the issue, responding because they are going to be the ones to look at the logistics. They are going to manage it. So if you disenfranchise those state and local government from those kinds of platform, then it is difficult for you to provide those kind of quick response when situations are going to happen. Any warning will be gathered from that level. But by Abuja, no ICS functional in Abuja, that for me is a defect, and INEC must, as a matter of fact, okay. reconfigure that particular platform and see how they decentralize it to every state and every locality. Now, Salahuddin, you highlighted uh, the stages uh, where election-related violence are likely to happen. You have pre-elections, the elections itself, and post-election violence. Earlier, uh, last year, uh, I, I believe in the last quarter of last year, the leading candidate uh, that were running for the presidency, I did sign a peace pact, you know, saying that they will make sure that they accept the results of the elections and uh, we won't have a situation where we have uh, post-election violence. Uh, do you think this peace pact is effective and uh, should it also uh, come down to other elective offices? Because it's only the presidency uh, that, you know, the, the leading candidates that are vying for the position of president that signed this peace pact. Should it come to senators and other uh, and senatorial and other elective officers? How effective uh, do this are these peace pacts? Uh, those peace pacts are just ceremonial, if you ask me, to be very honest. Uh, because people sign with their hands and not with their hearts. Uh, you sign a peace pact and then you go into the camp. In a ground, and then you see politicians uh, throwing words like javelin. Uh, they have turned campaign ground uh, into uh, arenas where words are used to lacerate uh, their position. So, what sort of peace pact uh, have they signed? What is the impact? What is the effect of those peace pacts? So, I see them as merely ceremonial and it doesn't uh, hold any water. So, yes, I agree that it should be uh, further decentralized. I know that some states also organize. Uh, similar events. Uh, but to be very honest, uh, it is very important for us to be very deliberate in what exactly we want. Campaign grounds should not be an arena for people to throw words and throw javelins and begin to call names. That is the place where hate are being fanned. You are fanning the embers of hate. You are actually inciting people. You are literally using those kind of words to tell that is, for me, the kinds of strategic and policy level uh, conversation that we should be having to say that any political party or any uh, candidate who uses vague word or anything in any rally would be bad completely. Mm. We must have a legislation to that effect. If you do not do so, you are going to continue to create a, a, a situation where you are saying that, look, elections are only meant for violence and that it must be that way. Otherwise, you see what has happened in our campaign, campaign since we really, see, in fact, as a this justice campaign, we have seen the issue of FFK and Dino Melaye and how they have been trading words. We have seen the kind of words they have used. We have seen how they have incited, uh, we have seen how the obedience issue has also created their emergence. And that, for me, is even a new dynamics to what might also happen even to election and post-election situation. The obedience are believing that because of the social media popularity and the various polls 
that has happened that they are actually going to win the election. You know, Salaudi, from what you're saying, it seems like all parties are guilty of this. I know it reminds me of the hate speech law. A lot of times <laughs> they say that people should not speak bad against the government, but you also expect them that they should live up to their responsibilities and also not incite violence and hatred as the electioneering period uh, draws near. Thank you so much, Salaudi. Of course, Thank we'll you. have further conversations on the election. Thank you so much, Salaudi and Ashim, conflict and security expert who joined us from Abuja, Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you.